SpongeBob SquarePants is a show that does not shy away from the bizarre. But when SpongeBob is embracing weird scenarios, they're typically a light-hearted weird, like with Idiot Box, or scary but come to a happy ending, like with the evil Doodle Bob. Season 5's Sponge Hen stands in stark contrast, following a disturbingly weird conflict and offering no satisfying resolution. Perhaps it's because of the combination of these two factors that this episode typically makes people's worst hundred episodes ever lists, though granted very seldom at or near the bottom. Is it bad? Is it good? I am not concerned with these questions, and I think our preoccupation with them has steered us away from giving the episode a proper interpretation. That being so, I'd like to present my own analysis of Spongehenge. I find Spongehenge above all to be a story about how modernity constrains the creation of art. SpongeBob has a clear artistic talent that sets him aside for other citizens of Bikini Bottom like Mr. Krabs and Patrick, but his commitment to the Ghosty Crab prevents him from fully realizing it. It's through art that we achieve immortality, a legacy that persists even past societal collapse. And while SpongeBob could not fully explore his artistic talents, he still is able to inadvertently leave something of himself behind, even though he collapses in despair falsely believing his life to be over with the destruction of his workplace. Before I get into my reasoning, let's go over a summary of Spongehenge's storyline. For those who have already seen the episode, feel free to skip ahead. The episode opens with Nat and Shuby exiting a diner amidst a windstorm. August seizes Shuby's leftovers out of her hand, carrying them through Bikini Bottom. The bag smashes through Spongebob's window and the contents splatter onto his face. Spongebob hokes his head out the window, looking for the leftover's owner, but to no avail. What Spongebob does discover is that the passing of wind through his pores creates a whistle. Spongebob hops out of his window and begins playing with his newfound talent. Jellyfish take an immediate liking to the music that he produces, buzzing around his insides. After a night of tomfoolery, Spongebob realizes that he'll have to rush to work to be on time, but the gales and jellyfish hold him back. In a panic, he calls Mr. Krabs, who reels Spongebob in and promptly puts him to work. But the wind gets to him even in there, interfering with his job. With the wind comes Spongebob's bodily music, inviting a swarm of jellyfish in through the chimney. Soon the whole restaurant is ripped apart by the storm, and Spongebob is thrown onto Patrick's rock. Spongebob slips inside and informs Patrick of his predicament, but the gusts blow open Patrick's rock, and Spongebob is exposed to the enamored jellyfish. Spongebob retreats to the one place the winds cannot play with him, the shelter of a cave. Unfortunately, Spongebob begins losing grasp of his sanity. Desperate for companionship, he chisels a replica of himself out of stone, conversing to it as though he were talking to a friend. Spongebob soon discovers the replica's holes produce a melody similar to his own, so he places the replica outside in hopes of distracting the jellyfish. However, the melody is out of tune, and the jellyfish angrily stings Spongebob. Spongebob proposes that if he were to produce more replicas of an even greater scale, the music might soothe the jellyfish. After God knows how long, he finishes his arduous project, the rich tunes of the statues appeasing the jellyfish. Finally freed from his prison, he returns to the Krusty Krab, now partially submerged in sand, ostensibly from the apocalyptic windstorm. We cut to 3,000 years in the future, where the sea is populated by an advanced race of aliens. Spongehenge has become a cultural site to the aliens, who are entirely ignorant of the circumstances of its creation, but aware of its significance to jellyfish, who annually flock to the stone circle. Jellyfish flutter around and through the statues as the winds continue to blow and produce this wondrous tune. We zoom into the agape mouth of a statue as Spongebob's laugh is heard one last time, and the episode closes. So what do we make of this? Is there any symbolism or meaning to the episode? I would like to briefly respond to a part of Karsten Runquist's interpretation of the episode as a way of segueing into my own. Karsten theorizes that the cause of the windstorm was the abandonment of the old god Neptune. 
He bases this largely on an exchange between Nat and Chewie at the start of the episode. Nat remarks that Neptune must be mad, as the wind is ferocious. Chewie laughs and corrects him as Poseidon actually has domain over the undersea. I'm not convinced that widespread apostasy is responsible for the chaotic weather. The precise cause of the storm is never specifically explained, and I believe this is purposive. As far as I see, the purpose of Nat's dialogue is to establish that the weather is ferocious and unusual, and Truby's dialogue is both a form of comic relief and a suggestion that residents of Bikini Bottom aren't yet entirely preoccupied with the storm. I read the situation with the winds to be somewhat Kafka-esque. One of the most influential authors of the 20th century, Kafka is known for his distinctive, long-winded, modernist writing, which invites countless interpretations. So what exactly does it mean to be Kafka-esque? Such an analysis is beyond the scope of this project, but I find Jay Halbori's essay on Kafka to be particularly illuminating. I'm quoting from a Londoner named Simon's blog, Books and Boots, which discusses the text, writing as follows. Borges says, Plot and atmosphere are the essential characteristics of Kafka's work, and not the convolutions of the story or the psychology of the hero. The blog expounds on this idea. We can quickly agree that few of the novel's stories have a plot in the conventional sense of a beginning, middle, and an end. His most famous stories tend to record a steady decline in circumstances and psychology until the protagonist dies. Indeed, I noticed something similar with Spongehenge. Spongebob's life is made progressively worse by the howling wind and the persistent jellyfish. He's carried away from his job, abandoned by Patrick, and retreats from civilization, forced to find companionship in a carved, cold likeness of himself. And when he believes he's found a resolution to this conflict, freeing himself from the cave, it turns out the world he has rejoined is barren and empty. The causation and exact nature of this windstorm are to me unknowable, as unknowable as why Joseph K. was arrested in the trial, or how Gregor Samson metamorphosed into a monstrous vermin. Similar to the plague from Camus' novel, it's a stand-in for a general or sudden breakdown that affects all strata of society. A breakdown that might keep food from your table, leave you unemployed, or take away everything from you. Perhaps the gales are an act of God, perhaps they reflect the cataclysmically changing climate. Regardless of what one takes the cause to be, the metaphor remains that these gales are a symbol of the colossal upheaval that is about to level Bikini Bottom. And just like any societal breakdown, the causes don't matter when you're the one thrust in the middle. What matters is that it's happening. A Kafka-esque interpretation has plenty of limits, however. There is a lack of constrictive bureaucracy, and Splinterup is far too optimistic to be a Kafka character. I just mainly believe we can draw a Venn diagram of Kafka and Spongehenge, and while the overlap is far from complete, it highlights aspects of the episode that we would otherwise miss. And there is one especially Kafka-esque aspect of the story I would like to highlight. Spongebob's reaction to the jellyfish continuing to swarm him in the morning. I told you guys I don't have time to play! <laughs> I have not been tardy one time in my career as a fry cook, and I'm not going to start today! <laughs> the problem for Spongebob is not that the jellyfish are swarming him, is that the presence is a hindrance to him going to work. Spongebob is much like Gregor Samsa in this regard, whose immediate concern after being transformed into an ungeheuerist ungeziefer is being late to work. Just like in a Kafka story, there is comedy here. A character is confronted with the absurd, but their immediate concern is, now how can I possibly work? In modernity, everything, everyone, and every interaction is subsumed by the economy. The strange cannot be appreciated or even acknowledged so long as it distracts from productivism. And perhaps I'm getting ahead of myself, but we circle back to this at the end of the story, when Spongebob rushes back to the crusty crab after ostensibly hiding in the cave for years. I return to Simon's analysis of Borges' commentary. When Borges writes that Kafka's work doesn't bother much with the psychology of the hero, I suppose what he means is that none of his protagonists are changed by events in the way that a classical novel is all about the change and growth in thinking and opinions of its main characters. The protagonists psychologize at a very great length indeed, but, in a sense, it is always the same problem they are worrying over, and they are permanently caught in the same predicament or trap, which shows no real psychological development or change. 
Indeed, after being holed up for an extended time in solitude, SpongeBob is just as committed to his job as ever, groveling at the ruins of a collapsed civilization that he cannot flip burgers for Mr. Krabs anymore. What's more, his first stop is not his pineapple, it's not his parents' house, it's his place of work. Working as a fry cook was, for SpongeBob, his highest calling. Escaping the jellyfish, then, was always a means to an end, for they were first and foremost for him a distraction from work. Whereas, it appears to me, SpongeBob's pursuit in life should not be serving an uncaring boss, but the creation of art. I now want to analyze three different characters from the episode, which reflect three different archetypes of how we live life. Anyone who knows anything about the character SpongeBob knows that he is brimming with creativity and playfulness. He has the carefree soul of a child, looking at the world around him in a sense of wonderment. And indeed, in this episode, the first thing SpongeBob does when he discovers the notes his body produces in the wind is to play around with them. The body is one of the oldest and most often forgotten instruments. Even the most ingenious musicians can forget the symphonies of music that our bodies are capable of producing. From hand whistlers, to throat singers, It is evident that music did not originate from blowing into external cavities or banging on primitive percussion instruments, but from using one's own body to its full symphonic potential. SpongeBob taps into the musical attributes of his body immediately. He contorts and maneuvers his body, increasing and decreasing the size of his pores to create different notes. It is second nature for him. SpongeBob is able to entertain himself with his musical abilities for the remainder of the night and into the next morning. How many of us out there could heed so much attention to our own bodies for a full night without requiring external stimuli? Yet SpongeBob masterfully makes an art of the wind passing through his pores. SpongeBob represents the artist, but not the fully liberated artist. SpongeBob is still hindered by the same social and economic norms that hinder the rest of us, the need to make an income and financially support himself, thereby preventing him from realizing his full artistic potential. And this Weltgeist has permeated in his SpongeBob's very psyche. He sabotages himself from realizing his full artistic potential, as demonstrated by his comedic preoccupation with his job above everything else. As talented of an artist as he is, SpongeBob would much rather be a producer. So let's take a look at the producer archetype next. Mr. Krabs represents the capitalistic mode of production. Mr. Krabs, throughout the series, and especially in later seasons, relentlessly pursues profit and views SpongeBob as little more than a means to this end. SpongeBob is indeed a sponge to Mr. Krabs, a skilled worker who Mr. Krabs squeezes for all he's worth. Mr. Krabs is not even remotely empathetic to SpongeBob's situation. He drags him to the restaurant with the fishing line and sets him to work post haste. For Mr. Krabs, the apocalyptic weather is no reason to close the restaurant. Nor does he sympathize with SpongeBob's struggle to commute to work. Even as the restaurant is completely destroyed, Mr. Krabs still clutches on to the cash register. In the midst of even the destruction of his physical establishment and perhaps much of Bikini Bottom, he still refuses to part with even a tiny bit of his material wealth. But what really interests me in the Krusty Krabs scene is SpongeBob's ingenuity and artistry. The aggressive wind blows SpongeBob's patty stacks, flinging them onto the wall. With the ubiquitous windstorm raging, traditional cooking and working techniques fall short. But resourceful SpongeBob is more than capable of adapting. He places the buns on the wall and allows the patties to be blown with them, and following the same strategy, he adorns the burgers with their toppings. It's this flexibility and artistry that allows SpongeBob to thrive where another less imaginative worker might be unable to complete his job. It's a display of versatility and artistic prowess on SpongeBob's part, contrasting it greatly with employees like Squidward who only do the bare minimum, and Mr. Krabs himself, whose biggest concern is pleasing his workers and keeping his profit rolling. 
But alas, SpongeBob's talents here are squandered, handed off to an aloof and negligent boss, and they will soon be blown away by the sands of time into oblivion. But as long as the Krusty Krab is standing, who are its services offered to? The consumer. Patrick represents the receiving end of production, consumption. He still leads his life the same as prior to the maelstrom, beneath his rock consuming food and the media. He is amused by the simple and the stupid. The fish weatherman explains the direness of the situation, and Patrick laughs at him being blown away by the wind. <laughs> Fishy go bye-bye. The inadvertent slapstick is all Patrick is capable of taking in, and not the fish's description of the severe weather. And once the female fish anchor woman concludes the segment, Patrick angrily throws his ice cream at the screen, saying the program is boring. It's very clear from Patrick's interaction that the purpose of news for him is mere entertainment, not the dissemination of information or intellectual reflection. Patrick is a simple hedonist. He runs towards sensory pleasure and runs away from sensory pain. It's the simplicity of this train of thought that causes him to reject SpongeBob, whom he cannot fully separate from the aggravated jellyfish. Patrick is much too lethargic and bothered with immediate gratification to produce the works of art that Spongebob might. Patrick is too incompetent to even work at the stage of production, spending most of his time at home merely consuming. And he is clearly incapable of surviving the turbulent storm sweeping through the town. Indeed, beneath his rock, Patrick is halfway to being buried beneath the sands alongside the post-apocalyptic Krusty Krab. Pestered by the jellyfish, Sunjob retreats to the safety of the cave. It's here where his sanity really spirals downward. He creates a companion out of stone and converses with it as if the effigy were sentient. He even erects a tea set out of rock for the two of them to share. Externally, Sunjob is free to pursue his artistic desires, but internally, he is as imprisoned as ever. SpongeBob's sanity collapses from his inability to work with the Krusty Krab. He finally has time for creative projects, but hardly the energy, distraught that he's being kept from work. From Sunshop's ability to create music with his body, to his skilled craftsmanship and make multiple statues of himself, it is at once apparent he is a highly talented artist. And were it not for the burden of returning to work on his mind, one wonders what he could have done. But would Sunshop have found the solitude isolating, even if it afforded him time to create art? I cannot help but question how much Sunshop truly desired outside companionship. It's of no small note that Sunshop does not construct the model of Mr. Krabs or even Patrick. His inanimate friend is a doppelganger of himself. It is not even a happy visualization of himself. The statue's mouth is frowning. Perhaps after the events that transpired in the episode, Sunshop felt there's no person other than himself who could be his confidant. After tea, when he gets down to business with his replica, he immediately confesses that the jellyfish have caused them much distress. As the events of the episode showed, Neither Mr. Krabs nor Patrick offered much sympathy. The only person who could offer sympathy at this point is SpongeBob himself, or rather the replica. I don't believe that SpongeBob turned into a misanthropist from this ordeal, but the repeated attraction of jellyfish to his music made SpongeBob realize that, insofar as the jellyfish danced around him, he would be a pariah unable to function within society. As such, SpongeBob concluded he had to resolve this problem before he could be reintegrated into the web of social relations at his bikini bottom. At the end of the day, I think external companionship is not what SpongeBob desired here, but a foolish need to return to labor at the Krusty Krab and integrate back into the economy. SpongeBob's solution is, of course, to create a circle of outwardly facing effigies of himself, with the same intricate system of holes which might distract the jellyfish. SpongeBob succeeds and immediately rushes to his workplace, which has long been destroyed. The tragedy here is that social isolation would permit SpongeBob to live a carefree and artistic existence. Without his economic obligations or shallow friends, he would have been free to play around with jellyfish and construct other marvelous monuments. Instead, SpongeBob grounds his purpose in life in creating burgers at a fast food restaurant, and so naturally his life is shattered once he discovers his establishment is gone. In short, SpongeBob cannot enjoy the liberation that the apocalypse would have offered someone of his abilities. The homage to Stonehenge is seen by many as entirely random, 
but there is a potent connection between Spongehenge and Stonehenge that I have never seen anyone point out. Much of Stonehenge is composed of rocks called bluestone, a material which is lithophonic. These rocks resonate like bells when struck. Indeed, bluestone and other such lithophonic rocks have been used in churches as bells. Whether or not Stonehenge was used as a giant instrument is a hotly debated topic which I will not dive deep into, and if anything, I'm skeptical of the claim. But the acoustic properties of the site are undeniable. Even if we reject the claim that Stonehenge might have been a primitive glockenspiel, it seems very likely that priests performing ceremonies would have enjoyed the resonant properties of the rocks, which both dampen external sounds and allow for the reverberation of noise within the circle. Both Spongehenge and Stonehenge demonstrate the significance of bending noises to the will of the builders. We marvel at the lengths the builders went to, working immensely heavy pillars of rock to meet some acoustic standards. Whenever we delve back into the ancient past, the sense we are most commonly concerned with is sight. The appearance of artifacts, the murals, the layouts of ancient towns, the garments worn by locals, etc. The other senses tend to take a back seat, and understandably so, for the decay of food, the loss of recipes, and the extinction of plant and animal species prevents us from fully appreciating ancient taste and smell, for instance. But Stonehenge and Spongehenge remind us of the variety of senses before us that, when working in tandem, allow for a richer cultural experience. In our world, the musical and oral rituals of Stonehenge are lost, and the sounds that reverberate off the stones are comparatively muffled, metaphorically speaking, yet we still unearth an inkling of the monument's potentially acoustic purpose. Whereas in Spongebob, the musical properties of the monument are on full display for the aliens, adding another layer of brilliance to Spongebob's art. While artifacts of producers in the form of tools and the artifacts of consumers in the form of litter can likewise be unearthed from the sands of time, it's always the traces of art that most fascinate. Venus figurines, cave paintings, and ancient monuments such as Stonehenge capture our imagination and allow us to peek into the mores and values of a forgotten civilization. Most societies will have farmers or hunters or fishers, but how does this society relate to the greater world around it? It's art that provides a glimpse into these relationships, and of certainly more flavor and passion than an ordinary discarded ad's head or aerochip ever could. The Krusty Krab, Patrick's Rock, and any structure from Bikini Bottom can probably be easily uncovered from beneath the sand, but the close of the episode, we're only shown the aliens interact with Spongehenge, Spongebob's final accomplishment. And to be blunt, this is simply because it's a superior accomplishment to anything that Mr. Krabs or Patrick could do. Mr. Krabs was concerned with fleeting profit, and Patrick was concerned with satisfying his basest desires. SpongeBob achieves immortality with his impressive monuments, which can withstand 3,000 years' worth of change. It's this immortality that allows us to hear SpongeBob's laugh from within the statue one last time. While the aliens state the identity of the sculptor is unknown, his character is clearly imprinted upon his works. Apart from the obvious, that each statue is a physical imitation of Spongebob, anyone can tell from the monument that the sculptor was a seasoned artist and deeply knowledgeable of the patterns of jellyfish, both of which being very true. Even after the undersea world has collapsed and become inhabited by an entirely new race, Spongebob's spirit lives on through his monument. When you're admiring a calcite statuette in a museum, it's not the source of the material that you are interested in, nor who the ruling chieftain was at the time, but it's the artist and how they're able to carve their vision onto the rock, and that their vision can at least partially persist through all of this time. It's the ability to imagine that separates artists from their contemporaries. This is how they achieve the longest of legacies. Sponge and similar such monuments are this artistic immortality par excellence. Where do the jellyfish fit in with all of this? Some argue that the jellyfish are malevolent, but I personally disagree. When Spongebob initially discovers his body's musical properties, they swarm but do not attack him. They treat him like a new habitat to explore. The jellyfish are only hostile when Spongebob tries to leave. 
SpongeBob and his friends are anthropomorphic fish in sea life. They're stand-ins for human beings, but in an underwater setting. But countless other forms of sea life in the show are merely that, sea life, without such high degrees of anthropomorphism. The jellyfish are in this category alongside clams, akin to butterflies and birds. All they are is wildlife. You can point to examples of jellyfish temporarily having human traits, but these are typically done for comedic relief, and either way, they're few and far between. Jellyfish are but wild animals. It's cut and dry, the jellyfish are at the very least at a lower level of consciousness than characters such as Spongebob, and more inclined to natural urges as opposed to artificial ones, like living in a building or driving a boatmobile. For this reason, characterizing the jellyfish as malevolent makes as much sense as characterizing a lion as malevolent for devouring an antelope. They are simply following their natural inclination to music, and this is something we see in other animals such as cows. The jellyfish react with hostility when Spongebob leaves because he is taking his harmonious music with him. Spongebob, unlike the jellyfish, is unable to live according to his nature because he has distinctively artificial obligations to fulfill, like work. The jellyfish cannot understand how Spongebob would leave, much like a dog might not understand that they cannot consume certain foods or relieve themselves whenever they so choose. The conflict between Spongebob and the jellyfish is reflective of the greater conflict between civilization and nature. There is one competing idea I have on the jellyfish, and I will relate it now. Birds have long been a source of divination to humans. Ornithomancy and augury, in particular, are practices by which humans believe they can discern omens from the behavior of birds. The sky is the boundary between the earth, where humans dwell, and the heavens, where the gods dwell. As such, birds often have the position of relaying messages between the two groups. In Norse mythology, Odin's two ravens report on the behavior of mortals to Odin. In Aristophanes' old comedy play The Birds, the Athenian birds construct the walled city in the sky to block communication between mortals and gods, claiming Zeus's throne for themselves. Many mythologies carry this common theme of a language by which we communicate the birds, a bird language. Perhaps you might view the jellyfish as agents of divine wrath or some unexplained force, but this is purely extrapolation. What I want to focus more on is Spongebob's ability to speak the jellyfish's language. It is incredibly ironic that humans, while still being animals, find such a seemingly untraversable gap between themselves and other animals. We hear dogs bark, but often don't understand what they bark for. We have lost our ancient connection to the natural world, but all girls and shamans remind us that this gap might possibly be bridged. Spongebob speaks the language of the jellyfish. And though you might dismiss this by the observation that Spongebob produced this harmonious tune to no skill of his own, that rather, it was the physical properties of his body that produced this music, as we've all seen, Spongebob was nonetheless able to masterfully construct a series of stone monuments that, re that replicated his bodily music. This shows a deeper connection to both art and the behavior and desires of the sea creatures of the natural world. Perhaps, in an alternate timeline, Spongebob might have been an oracle in the undersea world, defining signs based on the patterns of jellyfish behavior. But instead, Spongebob's duty to his job inhibits complete fluency in the language of jellyfish. He does not understand that it's his nature to produce sound in the wind, and that it is the nature of jellyfish to rejoice in and be slew by these noises. He thinks he can put the laws of nature on pause and retreat to the crusty crab. It's because of the sudden lapse in communication that the jellyfish lash out against Spongebob. It's akin to speaking to a foreigner in your native language, and your interlocutor suddenly loses the ability to speak the same language. Spongebob's work again prevents him from living up to his potential. I have been rambling for far too long. All things considered, Spongebob seems to be a story about the beauty of art, and a limitation about how the creation of art must be put on pause to allow for the production of commodities. Spongebob's creative talents are squandered at the Krusty Krab, a fast food franchise that will one day be lost to the sands of time. But his artistic creations, they can survive for millennia. Even the class of civilization itself is not enough to warn Spongebob that he ought to invest less time in Krab's extractive enterprise and more time into the creation of art. And finally, the question turns to us. If the world is the end tomorrow, what will our legacies be? Have we lived our lives as expendable fry cooks laboring for a callous boss?
have we devoted sufficient time to the refinement of our artistic talents? And finally, were the world to end tomorrow, would our biggest concern be not being able to punch time into a clock?